Hi, my name is Elle Billing. I am a chronically ill queer femme, and I'm tired. I'm here this episode and every episode to dig at the roots of our collective fatigue, explore ways to direct our care in compassionate and sustainable ways, and harness creative expression to heal ourselves and our world. And welcome to HURF, Radical Care in a Late Capitalist Techscape. My guest this week is Carl Dulitz. Carl Dulitz is a 37 and a half year old gay man who works retail by day and explores creative endeavors in his spare time. His hobbies include astronomy, fiber arts like knitting, crocheting, sewing, and embroidery, and visual arts of all forms. Carl and I have known each other for almost 20 years, and I'm excited to have him on the podcast today. Welcome, Carl. Hi, Carl. Welcome to Horf. Hey. Hey, it's great to have you here. I'm really glad that you were able to make it. Uh, how are you doing today? Oh my God. Today has been nothing but a self-care morning. <laughs> oh, wonderful. That That's a great lead into, you know, how have you received care this week? I, today even. What kind of self-care did you do? I slept in, uh, which doesn't normally happen. Um, I woke up early and I was like, nah, we're just gonna, we're just gonna pop a melatonin and see where this goes. <laughs> and then oh you're hitting um, the hard stuff and you're it's like but melatonin is like yeah we're gonna see where this goes <laughs> <laughs> when did we get so old <laughs> our drug of choice is melatonin <laughs> melatonin is the hard stuff um l-theanine is the one that helps to keep me asleep but yeah when you when you've got a cocktail of different like sleep options then you know you've reached that age <laughs> Yeah. Well, before we turn, before I hit record, I was talking about some statistics and stuff I found that we'll talk about later. But I had mentioned we are no longer young adults, like, and we haven't been for like a decade. <laughs> yeah, it's like when you have like your cocktail of drugs is all like uh, sleep aids and joint support <laughs> and migraine uh -huh. medications and stuff. It's like, oh, our party days are over. <laughs> When you know where all the supplements are in the supplement aisle and what they all do, you know you've reached an age. <laughs> oh, no kidding. One day I went to the pharmacy and so this, I hope this isn't TMI, but it might be. Um, when I have PMS, my ADHD is worse. So it's like the worst week of the month. Like I can't do anything. My brain just isn't functioning uh -huh. and it's like I'm not even driving my own body. And I had to go to the pharmacy and buy some supplements. And I said to the pharmacist, I'm really sorry. I my ability to scan the shelves is really impaired today. Can you help me find some magnesium? And it was like right in front of my face, <laughs> but I just couldn't see uh -huh. it. <laughs> and it's like, I usually know where these things are because I buy them all the time. I take as many supplements as I do prescriptions and I just know where they are. But, you know, I switched pharmacies yeah. <laughs> and I moved and the bottles all look different and I can't read. <laughs> I just can't do this right now. Help me. <laughs> I'm the youngest person in the pharmacy. Please help me find my meds. <laughs> I've been working retail for um, as long as I've known you. Almost as long as I've known you, uh, which is almost 20 years. Process that. My dad mentioned the other night. He goes, oh, your 20-year reunion is this year. I was like, yep, it sure is. <laughs> you know, the, the crazy part is... Um, I still see some of the ladies from the commons, like the, some of the lunch ladies from the commons shopping at Walmart. Oh, yeah, because you're still in Sioux Falls. Uh, the ones from our generation have finally retired, but I still see them and they're completely mind boggled that like I graduated 20 years ago or whatever, uh, 16 years ago. <laughs> yeah, time is time is wild. And now that I'm one <laughs> of those people who, you know, sees people who were little kids you know when i left town and now they're all adults doing uh -huh. adult things i finally understand why all the little old ladies at church were flabbergasted when i'd come home from college and they're like oh you've grown so much tell me what you're doing now yeah. and i always thought it was strange and now i'm one of those people and i'm not even that old <laughs> i judged a speech meet last weekend and i was talking to one of the students and i was like hey your mom was my volleyball coach when she was pregnant with your older sisters. Like, 
<laughs> just one of those like, oh, wow, time is yeah. wild. Just, so you mentioned working retail. You work at uh, the Walmart. Yep. And that you worked there in college, too. So you've been at that specific one yeah. for 20 years. Yeah, I started fresh, the end of freshman year of college. And um, when we graduated, it was in the middle of the recession. So I just didn't see any point in leaving. And then I picked up a second degree in the process. <laughs> okay, so what degrees did you end up getting at at college? Um, I got a computer science degree, um, and okay. then a week before uh, graduation, I realized I was only nine credits short of an art degree, so I stayed an extra year and picked up a second degree. Oh, fantastic! So that really feeds like your creative practice, then, which you share a bit on on Instagram, which is kind of how we reconnected, yep. even though we've known each other a long time. So, how does you know creative practice fit into like your self care routine? I discovered um, through a fun little adventure in hospital land that I have anxiety. And thinking back, I guess I've been self-treating it in different ways for a number of years. What I learned when I thought that I'd be single for the rest of my life, uh, I finally just like, I was like, I am not going to learn how to knit. I'm going to find a man who learns how to knit. He's going to make me all the stuff. I taught myself how to knit and I was married within a year and a half. <laughs> um, oh. but the, so wait, so you taught yourself to knit and then within a year and a half you were married. Yeah. That's <laughs> wild. <laughs> yeah. Six months after I made my first hat, I, I met my now husband. Um, and then within, a, within another four months after marrying him, I told him, yeah, I'm going to marry you. And he freaked out because he's Hispanic. And Hispanic parents, like Hispanic dads, are not okay with gay people. Yeah, I've I've met several other people who've experienced that. Yep. Within three uh, three months of that, he was like, "I want to marry you," and I was like, "Okay, let's do this." And <laughs> we got married. Oh boy, we've been married five and a half years now. Congratulations. His family still doesn't know. <laughs> oh. So it's kind of a secret thing. Okay. Yeah. So you, you know, your creative practice, you talked about knitting, um, you crochet too, right? Yep. I taught myself how to crochet last year through sheer luck. <laughs> oh, okay. What other kinds of, um, creative exploits do you, do you pursue? The list is pretty infinite. Um, in college, my primary areas of study were drawing, uh, primarily mm -hmm. uh, ink was my favorite medium as well as watercolor. I spent a lot of time in the ceramics room, and then I also trained as a printmaker. And then I taught myself how to paint in oil and acrylic in my spare time, because my mom taught high school art when I was a kid, so I've always just been around art supplies. And then my dad had a preference for photography that I accidentally picked up. And astronomy has kind of just always been a thing because I grew up in the middle of nowhere. So you could always look up and just see all the stars. Um, yeah. I mean, growing up on the farm here too, we had a pretty clear view of the sky most of the time. So I get that. Yeah. And then I, I knit, I crochet. Um, I can sew. I can, I do a little embroidery, just, you know, nothing complicated. I taught myself makeup for a while just for the heck of it because I, I just wanted to know how people could like, literally transform everything about their appearance yeah it's really fascinating um i i think makeup's really cool and i did you know i got a minor in theater at college um but i did not take the makeup class um because it just didn't fit into my schedule so makeup is not something that i ever really mastered and i have so many like skin sensitivities that it, it would have been really complicated for me anyway um oh, yeah. especially with all the latex they use um in certain like makeup prosthetics and like adhesives and stuff there are alternatives but one time in high school i had an allergic reaction to an eyeliner during a comp oh, during no. a play competition and it was just it was brutal my sister is super into makeup and that's like her art so the amount of money i spend on art supplies i think my sister spends on makeup it's just we have different canvases hers is her face mine is actual canvas <laughs> yeah um, the, the, so the psyche thing about makeup is like ounce for ounce that's like cocaine versus like coffee <laughs> yeah that's actually and that's a really interesting comparison because i am also super into coffee <laughs> Same. That's, so, that was part of my self-care routine this morning was actually going out for coffee and, and not paying for it because I had enough points built up. <laughs> oh, that's glorious. Yeah. I <laughs> When I moved in with my parents, my dad, you know, he's a farmer. He, you know, brings a giant yep. thermos of coffee out to the fields when he works. And during off-peak season, you know, like right now it's winter, but they're still doing other work. Mm. They take two coffee breaks during the day at 10 a.m. and at 3 p.m. in the shop. 
Um, and so they just drink a lot of like Folgers, right? Because you can make a whole bunch at one time. <laughs> I knew it was going to be Folgers. <laughs> well, yeah, you you know where we live. Um, so we yeah. have, my dad has his 12 cup coffee maker. And then next to that is my, my espresso machine, which takes up twice as much space and makes uh, a double shot at a time. <laughs> and my dad was talking about get, maybe getting like an instant pot or an air fryer for Christmas. And he's uh -huh. like, but we don't have anywhere to put it because and he like looks across the room and he goes, because your coffee machine takes up too much space. And I was like, uh, you can pry it from my cold dead hands. <laughs> that is a medical device. <laughs> <laughs> Just add another table. That's what I did. <laughs> Our counter space is all taken up by coffee makers and my mom's candy bowl, yes. <laughs> which I think she feels as strongly about as I feel about my espresso machine. <laughs> Try it from my cold dead hands. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like speaking of self medicating, uh, <laughs> coffee is great. <laughs> um, Absolutely fantastic. <laughs> I lost what I like. I was going somewhere with that, and then it totally fell out of my brain. So yeah, you had a great morning of self care. You had your coffee. Yeah. Do you have any current creative projects that like you're working on consistently right now, or is it? Just like whatever you feel like doing on any given day. My current process is two projects and an experiment. Um, okay. So what I'll do is I'll have ideas in my head of future projects that I don't necessarily have the technical skill for yet, or I don't think that I have the technical skill for yet. So um, I will take time to research them or just make like practice swatches. Mm -hmm. So like right now I'm working on making... Uh, two blankets. One of them is a knit blanket that's just a blanket, you know, like classic knit because I don't think I've ever done that before. And then I'm making a half circle crocheted blanket, which I first attempt didn't work. Second attempt is going great. It's longer than my arm span. But I, now I want to make a hood for it. And I don't have the technical skill for that yet. So I have to research that. That's That's my... That's the, the second half of my day. <laughs> yeah, that's. I have a similar approach to things that I do. Um, I have this never-ending list of ideas of art I want to make. And the project I'm working on right now is something that's been tickling my brain since 2018, at least. But I think if I had done it then, it would have been a bit anemic. I don't think it would have... Mm -hmm. Like, my aesthetic preference, uh, you know, surpassed my technical skill <laughs> at that point. And I think a lot of times it still does. Um, and that's a frustrating thing about being an art person is like our preferences are always going to be like the bar for those for it's, it's higher than richer what than what you're capable of. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but I finally I'm at the point where I'm like, I have to make this thing. It's going to annoy me until I don't. Um, and so now I'm working on it. Um, but I've also added like a million further influences and inspirations to it. So it's going to be very like conceptually multi-layered, but also like mm -hmm. tactily multi-layered as well. Um, so we'll see yeah. what happens. You know, maybe it'll be a big flop and I'll go, yeah, I should have waited. Or it'll be great. I'll be like, oh, I'm glad I picked the perfect time to do this. But at least it's like cathartic to like finally process it out of my brain and onto paper. I think um, our, our professors would tell you that that's how, how you make series pieces <laughs> oh yeah yeah first, i did that last year too so the, the first thing that you do in a series project will pretty much always suck but it's it's what you learn from that and build on that and keep going that gets you your master's degree i'm guessing <laughs> yeah a self-taught master's degree maybe <laughs> yeah You know, we have a few things in common and we both mentioned self-medicating a little bit and you mm -hmm. briefly touched on hospital land and I don't, I don't want to dig too far into like sensitive questions. Um, but I know, I know we have a few things in common. We grew up in small towns. Yeah. Um, we both came yeah. out in college, although that process was quite different, I think for both of us, um, for each of us. Um, and we both yeah. struggled a bit or more or more than a bit. We both had different struggles with substance use. Um, yep. I'm wondering if you are willing to share a little bit more about that since you did touch on it just a little bit um, and how oh, yeah. and how like art and like knitting and these processes have helped you with your sobriety. Yeah, I'm not afraid to talk about it. I'll give uh, a short abbreviated backstory. So I came out of the closet actually at 15 years old in the year 2000 
when the world was a different place. Yeah, I I went I went ballistic in college because I could, but I was before right. College. Yeah, you get out of the small town, you get to the <laughs> the booming metropolis of Sioux Falls, and it's like, oh, I can be gay here. People are nice here. <laughs> yeah, no one's no one's ashamed of me. No one's no one's uh, shying away from me. And in college, uh, freshman sophomore year, I didn't drink. Or uh, freshman year, I didn't drink. Uh, sophomore year, I started drinking. Uh, but then senior year of college was when I started to drink in earnest because um, my capstone class was geneal or not genealogy, uh, genocide in the 20th and 21st century. And the reading material Oof. was brutal. Yeah, that's heavy. Yeah, it was during J-term where there wasn't much else to do but uh, read your reading material for your one class and drink it all evening long. Then I, it, you know, it kind of waxed and waned and over the years and I usually kept a steady uh, amount of consumption more or less um, over the years. But then just before the pandemic happened, I found myself in a job that had a different level of stress that thinking back, it was a very social job. I went part-time at Walmart and then I went full-time at this job and uh, my drinking got out of control and then the pandemic happened. So everybody else was like, woo, we're home by ourselves. We can drink at five o'clock in the afternoon. And I was like, I'm in the, I'm at the thick of this. Cause by that point I went back to working full-time at Walmart. So the stress of everything there just made it that much worse. And, mm -hmm. um, my hands started to shake, uh, when I was working and I didn't like, I knew something was up, but I was literally in the headspace where I was like, well, let's just hope I die before this becomes too much of a problem. And, uh, I ended up, uh, discovering my alcohol dependency because I ran out, I ran out of liquor one day and I didn't have enough money because it was between paychecks. And, um, I ended up having a seizure and I was hospitalized and through a myriad of, uh, different things that happened, I experienced for the first time delirium and hallucinations. Uh, both auditory and visual and uh, trauma that I, I still haven't fully been able to confirm what parts are real and what parts my brain just made up as like a, a spackle shorthand to fill in all the cracks. So right. my, my journey did uh, through a number of failures and a number of hospitalizations uh, take me to a 28 day program. But my insurance company basically said that I was doing so well after 14 days, they stopped paying for it. And I've been learning coping mechanisms on my own ever since. I just, <laughs> I'm in shock, <laughs> but I shouldn't be surprised. Having battled insurance companies to get my medication paid for, you know, the, the one that keeps my brain working, um, <laughs> yep. that they would kick you out of rehab. Yeah. Halfway through your program. Well, obviously, I was doing great. <laughs> You're you were an overachiever, and they kicked you out. Heck yeah, that's my brand. <laughs> oh, um, man. I ended up in an outpatient program um, with the same um, Avera for people who who know this area. Um, mm -hmm. An outpatient program there, and I stayed in that for six weeks, and I had counseling until the end of that year. And uh, I discovered that uh, my insurance company was only willing to pay 10% of my counseling. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Every session is uh, $250 an hour. <laughs> that's horrifying. So that's what brought me to knitting and crocheting during the, the times when all I want to do is uh, drink. If you watch movies where people are like going crazy, like in their house, just like mentally trying to, to handle everything. A lot of the time they rock back and forth or like they're like shake or whatever. I just, I learned that knitting is basically like a more productive version of that where you can get all the like anxious energy out and then you get a blanket or a hat. <laughs> it's like productive pacing. They've done studies yeah. on using knitting in the treatment of PTSD. And I don't have those studies in front of me. I just remember hearing about them on NPR a number of years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's something about like, it's a bilateral, um, like repetitive movement. Yep. And something about the way it crosses the two sides of the brain and you're using both sides of your body in a repetitive movement and it can help heal some of those pathways. Um, but I'm not the expert and I don't have it in front of me. <laughs> So I should have looked that up before we started. Um, I'll probably find it and, and put it in the show notes. 
I'm I'm just still like aghast at the way insurance doesn't support sobriety and recovery or really any part of our medical system. Like this wasn't the direction I had mm-hmm. thought about going. Um, I had a, a cousin who passed away when he was 40 from mm-hmm. complications of trying to get clean and sober because the place he tried to check into wouldn't take him until he was detoxed and there wasn't a detox facility nearby. Mm-hmm. And like we're 37, 40 isn't that far away. Yeah. It was catastrophically, I can't even think, like just horrible to lose him for our family. Mm. Um, and like yeah. the weeks leading up to it, like it was like a long drown out process and it, of like hoping things would go better and then him getting on a transplant list and then that not mm-hmm. working out. And it, I mean, it's not just him. Like it was very much focused yeah. on him for my family and it's very personal, but he's not the only one that this happens to. I mean, you got booted from rehab and then they stopped paying for your counseling. It's like, how are people supposed to mm-hmm. address this? And when the, this country, our culture really, has such a, mm-hmm. a stigmatizing perspective on substance use, it's hard, like, it's hard enough to get people to reach out for help. And then when they do, like, yeah. we make it so hard for the help to continue like it's so in it's so inaccessible it's I, it's beyond inaccessible um prohibitive i'm so glad you're still here yeah through sheer luck uh, i mean when i had my seizure i had it uh in when i was at work but i had i was shaking so bad that i was like i need to go home and if i would have been on the road when i had my seizure i would have been gone i literally was in the front like the front entrance of the store when I came, uh, when I came to from my seizure and I was being loaded onto the stretcher. So, yeah. Wow. I, I wasn't thinking it was going to go dark, but it did. And that's okay. Um, <laughs> um, I laugh when I'm uncomfortable and not because it's funny. It's okay. Trust me. I've, I've had time to, I've had more time to process. process this than you. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, and I've known other people who've experienced complications and who have mm-hmm. lost loved ones due to addiction as well, um, or who have lost quality of life due to substance use. Um, mm-hmm. And the one thing we were talking about before we hit record was how the LGB population, and I say I, I, I don't say LGBT because the statistics I was looking up were specific to the LGB youth and yeah. young adult population, are at significantly higher risk of substance use disorders and substance abuse they're talking like youth high school students and those ages 18 to 25 which is not us anymore but Mm -hmm. that's the ages we were when we started drinking and i've been sober (sighs) since 2018 and my experience was different but i definitely had a problem which is not something that's easy to say right like it gets easier i think the more we talk about it but the first few times we actually say i had a problem Uh, so (laughs) Yeah, rates of alcohol uh, use were 25% higher among LGB high school students and 18% higher among those 18 to 25 compared to straight peers. And then high school students and LGB high school students and young adults reported two to three times greater rates of using hard drugs, including cocaine, ecstasy, meth, and heroin. Oh, yeah. I, I, also, I also found myself at at least one house party where where the people around me were emptying out their cigarettes, filling up, filling them up with cocaine and then smoking them. So, Yeah, I don't think I was ever around that, but that's because I was kind of oblivious. So I might have been. I had no idea until after. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I was really, I was really naive. Um, I think I was fortunate to only have gotten into some trouble with alcohol. But I think what a lot of people don't understand or choose not to look at is that we don't wake up one day and just decide... I'm going to drink myself silly. I mean, you mentioned self-medicating. I mentioned Mm -hmm. Mm self-medicating. We're trying to medicate something that hurts. You know, coming out at 15 in the year 2000 in a small town in the Dakotas or, (laughs) you know, feeling like for me, because I didn't know what bisexuality was until I got Mm -hmm. to university or college um, and thinking that something was very wrong with me and being surrounded by purity culture and a lot of the pray away the gay rhetoric and feeling very broken and scared um those are those are traumas those i mean those things can harm us 
those are one of like many reasons why along with like if there's rejecting adults or people mm-hmm. who actively bully or do those things um the first time i was called a dyke was in eighth grade and i don't think the people mm-hmm. around for that situation probably even remember it happening but i do <laughs> you know those things they stick oh um, yeah um a uh, good example uh i ran into fairly recently was there's this man who's a, been a regular customer at walmart for years and he was he was seeking validation he was like i'm nice right and i was like you haven't been in the past because one time he called me a faggot and <laughs> he didn't think i remembered that and boy was oh, he we surprised remember. we remember <laughs> yeah <laughs> like we have to we have to know who our safe people are mm-hmm. there's no way to to not or to just like write that off once it happens it's like okay you are forever branded in my brain as somebody that i need to be careful around yeah and it's hard when it happens like at your place of work it's not like you can't go there anymore especially with like (laughs) regular customers (laughs) some of these customers i've watched grow up (laughs) what i can say about bullying is uh as much as time and distance uh has taken it away there's still um that part of me that remembers how traumatic it was at 15 years old uh, actually, before I came out of the closet, because once I came out of the closet, I had my mother behind me uh, and the entire state education system because they are required by law to provide safe schools. Um, but before that, before anybody, before I knew that it was safe to even talk about uh, what these kids were doing to me, like I still remember all of that. And that still informs so much of my life and it how I relate to people even as an adult. It's absolutely formative. Um, I I knew my parents were accepting of gay people when I was growing up. Um, my mom had a mm-hmm. job, a summer job, sewing costumes for a performing arts school, and she would bring my sister and I with her. And that was my first really immersion and exposure to a large population of gay and queer people. Some mm-hmm. many of whom were in high school, but a lot of them were like the the staff at the performing arts school. Yep. And my mom like talked about it openly in a very positive way. Um, my cousin came out when I was in seventh grade, and my parents were supportive of him. So I knew like that was okay in my family, but like there was still like mm-hmm. the culture and the climate of being in the Dakotas in the nineties. I know when I was a kid going to church, uh, I, I grew up uh, Methodist. They were they were preaching how big of a sin it was from the the pulpit. Like they were taking time out of their their sermon to remind me that there's I'm not compatible with the teachings of the time. Right. Things you know for a while seem to be getting quite a bit better socially, um, but I I really feel like the climate right now is very hostile and very frightening for a lot of queer people, um, especially trans kids Mm -hmm. and trans adults who are in some of the more hostile states or really anywhere Mm because it bleeds over. Um, And we already live in a culture that just sort of generates trauma for people Mm -hmm. and then, you know, creates stigma for our maladaptive coping mechanisms. (laughs) We're just trying to get through. Um, And then, you know, we have to, then we have to battle our insurance to try and get better. It's kind of a downer, (laughs) but you know, at the end of the day, we, we we connect with the people who love and support us and we help each other get through. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I know what made a big difference for me was the, the 12-step group I joined during my divorce and then finding friends and people who had my back and who cared about my well-being. Mm-hmm. And yeah, a lot of, of angry painting. Yeah. And now I knit before bed for- because I have, ter- <laughs> I have terrible insomnia and knitting before bed it does have that calming effect on my brain because I like, it's repetitive. I count, I count, I count, Mm -hmm. I count stitches, you know, it keeps my hands busy. So I'm not on my phone before bed, which was kind of an issue for like, because it stimulates my brain and then I'm reading terrible news before bed and then I perseverate on it. And so like knitting before bed has been really helpful for me too. And then, yeah, you get, you make things and you get stuff at the end. Literally the blankets I sleep under. (laughs) Things can be terrible, but there are ways for us to mm-hmm. connect and support each other and get through it. Yeah, um, for me, um, I take I take a two pronged approach um, to being the light. So I I've been out of the closet for twenty three years now, 
um, which means that I've watched the world change in so many ways and I've watched the world get better and worse. Um, Mm -hmm. But um, as, as the pressure has been taken off of uh, the culture of gay males, or at least in my little uh, bubble, I've, uh, done my best to ensure that groups that don't have a statistically large enough voice to fight the laws that are being written have an extra ally um, on their sides. So anytime a new law is introduced into a state legislature, I start writing letters. <laughs> um, that is fabulous. Yeah, currently South Dakota um, is trying to ban gender affirming care for um, minors, Mm -hmm. um, which is terribly not fair because if your body is changing into a shape that you have no control over or that, that like you are actively rejecting, that's not going to turn you into a productive member of society. If society telling you, hey, you can't receive the care just to either figure it out by taking puberty blockers until your brain knows for sure as far as the government's concerned, or to actively lean into what you need just to to get where you need to go. I mean, I have a coworker who has a transgender child and when her child was starting to show signs that they don't didn't feel like they matched their gender, their mother literally just sprung into action. They're like, "What do you need? Do you need like binding tape? Do you need medication, counseling? What? How can I help?" Because I can't imagine how terrifying it must be for a, a mother to see their child acting out, knowing that something's different, but not even knowing where to begin, and then having the government step in and say, "No, you can't do that." when it might be the only thing keeping the child alive. Yeah. Yep. I I worked with a few students who were transgender and gender nonconforming mm-hmm. during my time at the school. And, you know, kids know. They know who they are. Even if they don't have the yep. language or the cognitive, like, mm-hmm. they, uh, they, like they the don't have logic. The... They can't outlogic an adult, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but kids know who they are. And yeah. As a teacher, I was like, well, why don't we just believe kids? Like, kids aren't as manipulative or they don't lie as nearly as much as adults think they do. Like, Mm -hmm. at the end of the day, kids want to be loved and accepted. And if we provide an environment for that, you know what? Amazing things happen. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I I appreciate that you very specifically mentioned that, like, you know, a lot of the pressure has been taken off you know, gay males, gay men, Mm -hmm. because that was really one of the first groups of our community at large to sort Mm -hmm. of make some of those steps up the ladder. And so for you to recognize that and say, okay, now how can I help someone else up? That is lovely. It is refreshing. It is, it it gives me some hope (laughs) or bolsters the hope that I have. It, it's only fair because there were so many angels that in my life that that reached out, um, professors at Augie, people in my hometown, uh, family members that I didn't even fathom would be okay with me being an openly gay man. Hell, even my grandmother is like 95 years old. And one of the things that she said uh, the last time we visited her, my older brother and I, she's like, why don't you bring your husband around? <laughs> Oh, that's so great. My grandma was really amazing too. Yeah. And for my part, my other contribution to the world of living in South Dakota, working in retail where I see hundreds of people a day is I do not shy away from saying my husband (laughs) or just being an openly gay man. Because for me, one of the, one of the scariest things is the unknown. So if I am known to somebody even for five minutes, and I seem like a a perfectly human human being, then uh, that's one mind one mind that I can potentially change. Yep. Well, that is an excellent place to say thank you for being yeah, here today. No problem. I really appreciate you taking the time to have a conversation with me. I look forward to seeing your crochet projects and more of your moon photography on Instagram. 
I love your moon pictures. They're just so gorgeous. <laughs> Trust me, the oh. next generation, as soon as the weather clears up, is going to be. I got some new, uh, some new equipment, so oh, I just have yeah. to figure out how to use it. <laughs> like a telescope camera, or like I, I don't even know what people use. <laughs> That's um, not my jam. Okay. I just appreciate it when it's other people's. No, that's cool. So I went from um, a telephoto lens and then just software editing. And now I have a telescope that I got some adapters uh, to adapt to my DSLR, essentially turning my telephoto lens into like triple the length. Oh my gosh, that's incredible. I'm so excited to see your next set of photos. Yay. <laughs> I just have to figure out how to use it all and then I'll be Yeah, good. <laughs> yeah, it's like that. But that's the thing. That's like stimulating to like your brain and your passion for art and stuff. And that's also one of mm -hmm. those things that helps keep us out of trouble. Exactly. Like, if we're not, if we're like stimulated and activated in a positive way, like. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Hoorf. To view the complete show notes and all the links mentioned in today's episode, or to get a full transcript of the episode, visit whorfpodcast.com. That's H-O-O-R-F podcast.com. Before you go, make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you can receive new episodes right when they're released. And if you're enjoying our podcast, I'd love to have you leave us a review in Apple Podcasts. Reviews are one of the major ways that Apple ranks their podcasts, so even though it only takes you a few seconds, it really does make a difference for us. Become a patron. For $3 a month, you can support the creation of this podcast, pay my editor, and join a community of fellow caregivers out here just doing our best. Thank you again for joining me, Elle Billing, in this episode of Horf. Until next time, be excellent to each other. Hoorf is hosted by L. Billing at L and Wink. Audio editing by Ricky Cummings at Ricky Poo. Music composed by Ricky Cummings. Hoorf is a production of L and Wink Art Studio, all rights reserved. Hoorf Podcast can be found on social media channels at Hoorf Podcast at H O O R F Podcast.